another Turing Dev Talks. My name is Jose and I will be your host for today. I'm Tanin from Montreal, Canada. And today on the panel, we have Salman, which joined us from Pakistan. Uh, he has over seven years of experience in the software industry and he's working in Tano at Turing and he has worked in multiple projects here and he's expert in Node.js and React.js as well. But today we're going to be talking about Next. Nest JS, yes, not next. Yeah. Nest JS. Yes. Yeah. And so let's get started. Hey Simon, uh, how are you doing? Uh, how is your day doing so far? And how is the working tree to you? Hey Jose, thank you for inviting me here. I'm doing good and I'm just go, go, getting back to work. It's the first day of the week. So just going through the pending task and setting up the meetings required to plan how basically our week's going to go. So looking forward to that. And uh, there's also some integration pending between one of our products that I'm also looking forward to. It will help us open more channels and ease up our workflow as well. Nice. It, that's, it sounds like you had a, a, a quite uh, relaxing, fulfilled weekend, right? Um, so um, let's now get deep in, in this discussion, okay? Uh, could you please uh, tell our audience uh, a little bit about Nest.js? So what's Nest.js? Well, Nest.js is basically a framework that is built on top of Express.js that was already available in the market. What it does is that it adds multiple functionalities and uh, out-of-the-box APIs that you can use to leverage those and build something better and with less code. So basically, you have a bunch of code that is already done for you, and you can just use those to get a, a step higher basically. So uh, the core concepts are that it basically relies and ha heavily depends on the Angular architecture. It's inspired by it basically. So you have a bunch of files nested under a structured environment. So it's mm -hmm. also scalable and it divides that into multiple modules. So you only have to deal with a feature at a time and it makes them testing and them easier as well. And apart from that, it follows the MVC architecture as there are multiple modules and views and controllers as well. And apart from that, you can also leverage services to have uh, abstracted code that does basically a job and you can have them available as anytime you want. Nice. That's basically and Nest yes. Nice. And how Nest.js is as different from the other frameworks? Well, it's different in the sense that there is a good structure for even newbies to get started. There is a CLI tool that can help you scaffold multiple parts of the application. And you, even, even with a single command, you can have a whole new feature scaffolded and ready to start working on. So it will give, give you a module, a controller, a service, and along with that, a testing file as well to get you started on those, that front as well. And apart from that, there are also multiple templates and developers available. To get you to to get you to avoid that initial uh, mm -hmm. boilerplate that you have to write every time you start a new project, so that's helped in that as well. And it and it is completely done on TypeScript, so even uh, someone with uh, no experience can with no experience in backend, but experience in the front end can get started on Nest.js, and they can build a scalable backend through it. Uh, yeah, that's that's is that will tie my next question. So, how is uh, the learning curve for Nest.js application? So, let's suppose I don't have any experience with uh, Node.js. Let's suppose I know like Angular on the front end. So, how hard is for me to get onboarding this project and start working? Well, if you follow Angular, that gives you an advantage as well because it follows the exact architecture of Angular. How Angular divides modules and has, has them lazy loading instead of loading them uh, at the start to mm -hmm. minimize load times. And the testing is done separately in modules as well. So if you guess, if you only know Angular, then it's really easy to get started. When I say you just have to follow the official documentation, install the official CLI from the NPM packages and you can get started. And it will help you, uh, it will help you add code where it needs to be done. So you only have to add code and not worry about the initial security measurements and everything because those are already done, done by you, uh, by the framework. There are multiple recipes provided as well that you can use to have third-party operators uh, added there as well, like password JS for authentication and such. So it, the learning curve is fairly steep in my opinion. Nice. And so 
Uh, so if you come from jQuery, you have a problem, right? Because it's totally different, right? Um, Not uh, different as such because you'll you'll still be writing JavaScript, but you will what you essentially be doing in jQuery is you'll be uh, you are working on the front end. So yeah. in back end, you'll just have to be leveraging JavaScript to fetch data from the back end and uh, push it to the front end in the form of API. So you already know the syntax, you already know how loops and conditions work. So just it's only a matter of figuring out how an API works basically and parsing the request from the front end and uh, returning a response. That's great. That's really great. So now you can, you could be a full stack uh, JavaScript developer if you learn how to use uh, Nest.js, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Quick questions, because uh, I've seen people asking me a lot, so they are very confused about this. What's the difference between Next.js and Nest.js? Well, Nest and Next are ends of the pole, basically. The Next.js deals with front end which is what everyone views in your website. And Nest.js deals with what the data, where the data is stored, how to push data to it, how to basically cha make changes to it. So if you browse Facebook, for example, the uh -huh. post that you see, that's, that could be done in Next.js, the post, the animation, the loading, and multiple pages. Uh -huh. But in Nest, the actual posts will be there in Nest.js. And Nest.js will basically be pushing the post to the front end or the mobile app. And then you'll be viewing it on the Next.js basically. So Next.js is a front-end framework. It's basically React, but it's server-side React. So it's already parsed React basically. So your browser will not do the parsing. The server does the parsing and it runs, returns a cached version of that. So it loads faster as well. That's great. That's great. Um, so uh, I have been using Next. JS for server-side rendering uh, React application, okay? And does uh, Next.js do this job too? Next.js, Next.js is a backend framework. It does not do the front-end bit for you. What it does, it does run, run on the server. If that's what you mean. It, the rendering itself, the multiple APIs are done on the server and then it gives you a response in the form of JSON or uh, XML if you want. All right, that's what they are confused. So we cannot use Nest.js to pre-render uh, React.js application, right? If you want to do that, we have to go for Next.js, right? Yeah, exactly. All right, that, that's great, man. So um, when should we use Nest.js rather than Express.js? Well, we should always use, I guess, Nest.js as opposed to Express.js because you get a bunch of new functionality and a bunch of already pre-made layers that you can use uh -huh. to leverage uh, multiple third-party providers as well. And Express, you'll have to manually do that and also structure it accordingly according to a standard by your organization. Nest.js already has a structure and you just have to follow it. And apart from that, the database integration is a lot easier in Nest.js because it comes bundled and uh, supports multiple ORMs as well. ORMs help you manage the database and uh -huh. uh, create read and create migration and seeders as well, so it makes it a cinch as that as well. Okay, so Nest.js support migration, right? No, type ORM supports migration. Nest.js supports integration. Okay, with got, it, got it. So for my for use migration, you have to use a third party uh, library or third party module uh, uh, with Nest.js, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so. Um, so what, what would you say that are the best practice or the best features of Nest.js? Well, the main features are the modules, the lazy loading modules. It doesn't load all everything at once. It only loads things when they are needed. So it minimizes the load time for someone who's just casually browsing. And the there is a structure uh -huh. that you always need when you are building something scalable. You don't want code every uh, here and there, you just want a specific structure and what it does, it divides them by features. So it makes features easier to manage and you can have features within features. So there's, uh, you can help that as well. And uh, the ORM bit is also uh, comes in handy when you only have to worry about setting up how the other ORMs are working and it will take care of mapping the database to your models as well. Nice. And uh, just to uh, add to that, I was going through a GitHub okay, the other day and I was surprised to see that um, as of 
now Next.js, uh, Nest.js has about uh, 142K daily users and more than 300 contributors. So that is really uh, amazing, incredible. So um, now, Simon, uh, we have talked about uh, various features of uh, Nest.js, okay? Um, but I think our discussion will be incomplete without talking about uh, microservices in Nest.js, okay? Uh, my first question, is that possible or could you shed some lights on what are microservices and uh, why use Nest.js for microservices is a, a great choice? So microservices in Nest is uh, possible. It's even supported out of, out of the box. You can have multiple instances of Nest and they can be connected, not, not through the AD port of the Apache server. They can be connected internally through a TCP port dedicated to the, the specific microservice. So you can have a socket-based connection between the microservices as well. And you can specify when you create a new project, you can specify if this is a microservice and then it will behave accordingly and you have access to a multi mm -hmm. multiple different packages that will make this job a little more easy as well. Nice. Um, so, uh, so first it's possible, right? So, and then, yeah. then do you recommend we go for uh, microservices or uh, is there a, something else that you would like to highlight, which is also a great of, uh, for using Nest.js? Uh, the discussion to choose between monolithic and microservices is based on yes. your product basically. So you could use a microservice when you have multiple different products and they need an authentication service. For example, you could have one microservice that is dedicatedly uh, providing user auth and as social logins and everything. And, it's, and all of your products are using that microservice. So you can have a common base ground through that. But if you only have a couple, a couple of products and they don't need this functionality, they can you can only have a monolithic architecture and you can be done with that as well. Nice. And so it's if you go for microservice, it will be easy to scale up and integrate all your projects, right? Yeah, that's basically yeah. what they're for. Nice, nice, interesting. So, and I'm sure this would give our developer uh, a good idea uh, why Microsoft is uh, good for, okay? Um, and here, I would like to call upon our senior uh, developers. So if you have uh, more than three years of experience and uh, you're willing to work remotely, okay? You can go ahead on tutoring.com uh, slash jobs. Okay, search for the job that is more suitable to your tech stack. and if you are confident uh, with your text text, with your skill sets, go there, apply for a job, pass through the vetting process, and then you'll be able to work remotely as Selma and, uh, and I did. And just to add something on it, so that's not, the, this is not the first time that I met Selma, okay? I met Selma one year ago, uh, around one year ago, in one uh, one-on-one interview for uh, internal position, uh, Selma, uh, I would like you, uh, please, if you could share some, um, how did you feel during the, the interview process that we had a year ago? And so and tell me just a little bit, how is your work at Turing since then? Yeah, so the interview process itself was very straightforward. And what I basically did was I signed up on Turing as a developer. And there were multiple tests that I needed to pass. There was an MCQ test and there was the live coding challenge. After I passed those, an HR recruiter from Turing, uh, they saw my profile and they contacted me for internal vacancy there. So from that, uh, that point on, that HR guy managed everything in all of the interviews and he set up every single one of them and he was always available through WhatsApp if I needed any questions. And this got the whole onboarding process done within I think less than two weeks. I was all, already onboarded. So that guy Ranjit Sangam, that guy did a great job at the interview onboarding process. And after that, I've been working on the internal theory products and it's been a really great journey so far. Nice. So for how long have you uh, been working internally at Turing? Uh, since the last July. Oh, so this is so about quite eight, one year, months. right? Uh, yeah, yeah, quite a long time. So that's why yeah. Turing is, came from, to, uh, to provide a long-term uh, partnership with developers, right? This is not a freelancing platform. So you just get, you don't get jobs for one month or, or projects, okay? So you will working uh, 
remotely for tutoring for a long term. So I have been working yeah. for tutoring almost uh, almost two years now. Okay, and so this is a great experience that I have been uh, taking at tutoring. And I recommend you if you would like to to work remotely, uh, go to tutoring.com slash jobs. Uh, apply for uh, the job that is suitable to your tech stack. Uh, as Selma mentioned, so you have to uh, pass through the process. The process will involve you create your account, uh, pass into MCQs, okay, which are uh, dedicated to your tech stack. So you're not going to take MCQs for Python if you are a JavaScript developer or vice versa. And after that, you have to take the code challenge. Uh, and once you clean the, these steps, okay, you will be on board and tutoring and get a job as we did and as I'm proud of. Okay, so thank you Simon for sharing this valuable information. It's time to wrap up our talk today. Uh, that was my pleasure okay, to talk with you today. Uh, and before we go, I would like to ask you, do you have some uh, resource to share? So how, how people can learn Next.js and be someone like you? Yeah, so Next.js has an official documentation that's available on the website, Next.js.com. You can Google through it uh, as well. And in that there is entire sections on the multiple different aspects of Next.js that you can use to leverage those according to your application. And apart from that, there are also multiple tutorials available on udemy.com as well that you can also use. There's sale going there, I think uh -huh. almost daily. And every time I go visit there, there's a sale going on. So you can use that as well. Nice. Okay, so uh, I just forgot to, to mention that. So in terms of position, okay? So how do you see uh, Nest JS position in the next five years? Should they invest to learn Nest JS or not? Yeah, if you learn Nest JS, it will not only give you uh, an entire overview of how a backend should work, it's also really scalable. So even after five years, our application will still be running and will be able to handle multiple different traffic as well. And even if there are multiple upgrades or changes to it, it's still at the end JavaScript that you can uh, you can add multiple packages to it and to override multiple aspects if those become outdated. So you can do that as well. Replace some of the uh, base packages with something more upgraded or cutting edge. Nice, nice. So last question, I promise you. So uh for people get jobs in nest js okay so uh what should they learn should they learn javascript should they learn uh sql database uh graphql uh just to increase their chance to get a job so uh, i would say what's the tech stack so the tech stack is only javascript and they must have a basic idea how a database should work they can they're not limited to using an SQL. If they do not know how it works, they can use MongoDB as well and uh -huh. just play with objects like they're used to in JavaScript. So that will help them ease uh, that that will help them ease the learning curve on the database side and they can get started through Nest. There's all there's an official package available as well, Mongoos, that will help you set up Nest.js with MongoDB. So even if someone with a little knowledge of how JavaScript should work, they can get started. And TypeScript is just JavaScript on uh, syntax, syntax checking, basically, uh, not syntax checking, it's uh, type checking. So you can have objects in their classes and the functions in JavaScript as well. Uh -huh. All right, so they, they should focus on, on JavaScript, right? Not Angular, not uh, React.js, not Vue.js. This is a totally different approach, right? They, yeah, this uh, is a backend framework, yeah. They should only be using it to learn how a backend should work. The other frameworks are for the front end side. That was quite helpful. Thank you for sharing these amazing tips. So now, now, now developers know the difference between Next.js and Nest.js. And one is for front end and the other one is for back end. So uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like uh, this video, smash this like button, subscribe to our channel and comment down below uh, what kind of videos you would like to see in the upcoming video. Uh, till then, uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Clubhouse, YouTube. Keep close to tuning because I'm pretty much sure once you pass the vetting process, you'll get the job as we did. Okay, till then, that's a wrap. Thanks for doing this meeting and I hope to see you again.